Sane Occultism by Dion Fortune Narrated by Matthew Schmitz 18. Standards of Judgment When the seeker after truth has come to the conclusion that occult science gives the explanation of life which satisfies his reason, and that the way of initiation is the ideal which satisfies his soul, what is his next step to be? He has a wide choice of literature on the subject, not all of which has the same viewpoint, though, upon essentials it is substantially in agreement. He is surrounded by an innumerable company of esoteric organizations, all competing for his adherence. Once received into these circles, he will come in touch with numerous individuals who claim to be able to train and initiate him. What should be his attitude towards all these? He will not have advanced far upon the occult path before he is aware of his need of a teacher. All the books tell him that initiation is essential to his progress beyond a certain point. How is he to obtain that initiation? And how, above all, is he to know which of the societies offering it to him is able to perform that which it promises? In the pursuit of his occult studies, and in the selection of a teacher, to whom, at the outset, he must give his adherence, and whose discipline he must accept, the seeker after initiation needs to look for three things. Firstly, right principles. Secondly, genuine knowledge. And thirdly, such common sense and capacity as shall prevent a teacher from involving his pupils in muddles and misadventures. How is the pupil to test his prospective teacher for these things? Furthermore, is he entitled to test him? I have heard would-be teachers most indignant at the idea of being tested by their pupils. They declare that the recognition of their status is the first test the pupil has to pass. If he is sufficiently intuitive to be worth training, he will see what they are on the inner planes without need to investigate their records on the outer plane. This is all very well, and may be true enough so far as it goes, but there is absolutely no reason why the pupil should not confirm his psychism, provided he has any, by investigation on the physical plane. Moreover, it is hardly fair to ask of an untrained beginner in occultism that he should trust to his psychism in a matter of such serious import as the selection of a teacher into whose hands he is to commit himself, for although no actual oath of obedience may be required, the fact remains that for all practical purposes the neophyte is pretty much in the hands of his initiator at the outset, and if the senior occultist's power is abused, the neophyte is in for an unpleasant experience, to say the least of it. The true initiator will no more exercise undue influence over his pupil, nor abuse his superior knowledge, than will the honorable doctor over his patient, nor the honorable lawyer over his client. But there are black sheep in every profession, and the occult world, unfortunately, is not sufficiently organized to permit of its black sheep being officially deprived of their power to practice. Therefore, the would-be pupil has to look to himself pretty sharply, especially in his early days before he knows the ropes. The reputable occult teacher, who has nothing to fear from the examination of his record, has no reason to object to having it examined. He ought to be prepared to answer the questions of the person who is proposing to entrust his spiritual advancement and mental welfare into his hands. Why should not he tell a genuine pupil how he received his training, the nature of his contacts, and the source of his financial support? It is only reasonable discretion on the part of a prospective pupil to make such enquiries. To neglect to make them would imply carelessness and lack of discrimination and ordinary common sense. It may be taken as axiomatic that the person who has nothing to conceal does not resent being investigated. The student has a right to ask questions and ought to turn down unhesitatingly the teacher who cannot or will not give a satisfactory answer. The question of money is one that looms large on the horizon at this point of the quest. It is an axiom of occult science that no price may be charged for any form of occult work. It may be generally presumed that the teacher who has his price and sticks to it is exceedingly unlikely to be an initiator of the right-hand path. On the other hand, we must remember that a teacher or society is certainly entitled to make a sufficient charge to cover the expenses in which it may be involved. Printers will not work for nothing and lecture rooms have to be heated, cleaned, and owned by someone. It is certainly reasonable to make a charge for value given on the physical plane because somebody is out of pocket in respect of it. Pretty moderate charges, however, 
will usually cover the actual running expenses of any movement. There ought to be no fee in connection with occult work, which it is more convenient to pay by check than by coin of the realm. Another problem, however, comes up in this respect. The occult teacher has to live, and if he has no private means, must either follow some remunerative pursuit or live by his occult work. If that work is sufficiently extensive to make considerable demands on his time, he must either curtail his work or give up his profession. Under such circumstances, is the occultist justified in allowing his esoteric work to support him? Yes, if it is done in the right way, if he clearly and obviously never permits his remuneration to become a money-making affair, but simply a means of support in order that he may pursue his work, and a very modest means of support at that. The seeker after initiation must recognize that his teacher has to pay the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, and not unreasonably demand that he should have private means or live on air, but he may justifiably have his doubts of the adept whose pupils appear to find him an expensive pet. It is very necessary also that the seeker should assure himself of the purity and cleanliness of an occult school. Occultism, as has been pointed out in a previous chapter, is not infrequently used as a cloak for assorted irregularities. The occult forces, especially when concentrated by ritual, unless thoroughly understood and properly controlled, do undoubtedly act as stimulants to the baser aspects of human nature. Self-aggrandizement and lust. Human nature, in bulk, is at best a doubtful commodity, but when it is submitted unregenerated to the powerful stimulation of occult forces, it is apt to be a highly explosive one. The seeker can form a concept of the purity of a school from the character and conduct of its leading members. What type of person wins advancement in this school? If he observes intelligence and integrity among its more prominent supporters, he may conclude that the inner workings of its organization are satisfactory. It will be noted that the qualities for which he is instructed to look are very mundane virtues. Spirituality, devotion, psychism, occult powers are not reckoned among the qualities by which the true occult school is known. Why is it the seeker is counseled not to look for the things which he most desires to find? For two reasons. Firstly, because these things are so easily simulated, and secondly, because the possessors of the higher spiritual qualities do not wear their hearts on their sleeves for daws to peck at, and the person who goes off into unexpected trances in public is more likely to be an epileptic than an adept. All phenomena are most carefully guarded by the genuine occultist, and he will only exhibit his powers to people who have won his confidence. In any case, the power to perform phenomena though it is a proof of knowledge, is no proof of integrity. A man may be a very great psychic and also a very great rascal. There is no correlation between occult powers and spirituality. The thing which is really of value in occult science is not the power to perform marvels or receive wonderful experiences, but the insight into the significance of life and the universe which its teachings give, and the power which its disciplines possess to raise the mind to spiritual realizations. If we look upon occultism as a means to spiritual ends, not magical ends, we shall obtain a true perspective. The psychic phenomena are incidental, a byproduct of the real work. This is the distinction by which the initiator weeds out his pupils. He knows that the person whose interest centers in the marvelous will never make a serious student. Therefore, he will not be inclined to attract a prospective pupil by an exhibition of phenomena, because he knows that the kind of person who would be attracted by such an exhibition is not the kind of person who is going to be any good to him as a disciple. In a genuine occult school, phenomena are only shown to people who have passed their probationary period and been definitely accepted as students. The occultist who exhibits phenomena indiscriminately is either too ignorant to be aware of the significance of what he is doing or too unscrupulous to care. With regard to the assessment of the actual knowledge which a teacher may possess, the seeker must again fall back upon the test of considering the caliber of the senior students by whom he sees the adept surrounded. He himself, as an outsider, is not in a position to form any first-hand opinion because the more an occultist knows, the less communicative he is apt to be. The best way of forming an opinion, therefore, is to consider the type of pupil who is passing into the higher degrees. Are they people of outstanding intellectual and spiritual quality? For remember, 
spirituality alone will not make a man far in the mysteries. He must have intellectual powers as well. If one sees numbers of well-meaning and enthusiastic ladies of the lecture room, tramp type being advanced to the higher degrees, one can be pretty certain that those higher degrees do not contain anything worth having. It is also a bad sign to see a teacher without pupil teachers assisting him. If he is operating a genuine initiatory system, he will have pupils coming along who are on the way to become adepts on their own account, and of whose services he is only too glad to avail himself in order to lighten his own burden and extend his work. But where the leader is like a star and dwells apart, one of two things is certain. Either he has no system by means of which he can advance his pupils grade by grade, or he is of so jealous a disposition that he will not impart any real knowledge to anybody, lest he should be raising up rivals. In such case, he is of little use as a teacher. It is also exceedingly necessary to be cautious in entering into associations with a teacher who is known to be interested in political activities. Those who desire to form an organization for a purpose which they desire to conceal have from time immemorial found in the occult system of organization a convenient cloak for their purpose. To be involved in such an organization is to lay oneself open to considerable unpleasantness. In my opinion, anyone who is taking a prominent position in any spiritual movement ought, in fairness to his followers, to leave politics alone. It is not right to ask people to eat their politics and religion off the same plate. Then again, it may be asked, why should common sense and reasonable capacity in the affairs of life be regarded as one of the signs by which to test a teacher. It is well known that the spiritually minded man is often a child in worldly matters. Do not let us forget, however, that there is a great difference between unworldly unsuspiciousness and muddle-headedness, and we can see the two types well exemplified in the Vicar of Wakefield and Mrs. Jellaby, the concern of the latter for the natives of Borabulaga being such, according to Dickens, that she paid no attention to the yells of her own offspring, whose head was jammed in the banisters. Quite apart from the general confusion, discomfort, and quarrels, which are inevitable in the organization of an unpractical teacher, things which effectually prevent any steady work from being accomplished, there is a real danger in handling big occult forces in conditions of emotional disturbance. It is quite likely to lead to at least temporary unbalance, Unless a teacher has sufficient knowledge of the management of the mind to be able to make his own mind function efficiently, he is exceedingly unlikely to be able to guide his pupils safely through the difficult phases of occult development when the mind is changing gear from one type of consciousness to another. Occult training ought to produce a clarification of consciousness and heightening of the powers. If any system produces a general incoordination and neurotic condition, it is a thing to be avoided. A sound and true system of initiation shows itself on the mundane plane in the harmonious ordering of all things. If an adept is himself in confusion and distress, will it not be a blind leading of the blind when he seeks to teach the deeper understandings of life and its laws? There is another point upon which the seeker is often perplexed, and which it is as well to consider in order that a clear understanding may be arrived at. He has already been counseled to judge an occult school by its senior students. What opinion ought he to form from the statements of those of its members who, for one reason or another, have left it dissatisfied? Here again, he must exercise caution and common sense. On the one hand, he does not want to disregard warnings and involve himself in unpleasantness. And, on the other, he does not want to be put off something which, although it might not have proved suitable for the person who warns him, nevertheless might be of great value to himself. He must also remember that one story only holds good till the other is told, and that when he has heard the pupil's explanation of his reason for leaving, he has only heard half the tale. He has still to hear the teacher's opinion of the pupil before he is in a position to come to a judgment. The person accustomed to sifting evidence does not judge so much by the tale that is told as by the manner of its telling, and experience proves that the statement that is made with heat and bitterness ought to be corroborated before it is believed. There are various reasons for which a person may cease to be a member of an occult school, and the inquirer, if he is shrewd and observant, can usually form a pretty good opinion as to which was operative in the case of the person before him. People shake the dust of an occult school from off their feet, for other reasons than because it fails to come up to their expectation, 
they shake it off with even more emphasis when they fail to come up to its expectations. There are also many reasons why even apparently right-principled persons bear false witness. Many people try experiments in practical occultism without the slightest realization of what it really is, and, disregarding the instructions of their teacher, burn their fingers. Cases also occur wherein people volunteer to assist in some difficult and dangerous occult undertaking, such as the hunting of a black magician, and at the critical moment their nerve fails them. Are these people going to admit that their courage was not equal to their curiosity? They have to account for their defection somehow, and the more bitterly conscious they are of their own failure, the more bitter will be their denunciations of the leader they have let down. We must also remember that there is a good deal of mental unbalance in our modern society, and that nothing causes it to flare up quicker than any attempt at practical occultism. Occultism is a mine of rich ore, which well repays the working, and the fact that much of it requires smelting and refining should not deter us from the task. It is no pursuit, however, for the unstable-minded, the ignorant, and the credulous. Three things are necessary for its safe pursuit. A living spiritual faith, a level head, and a sound knowledge of the psychology of the subconscious mind.